Hello, welcome everybody to the Blue Economy CRC's third webinar series for 2020. Um, today's webinar is about offshore aquaculture units and support vessels and the challenges and industry approaches to supporting offshore aquaculture and renewable energy production. Just to introduce myself first, I'm Professor Irene Penesis, the Research Director for the Blue Economy CRC. And I'd like to, of course, introduce two very important speakers that we have with us today, which are Per Oland from DMVGL based in Oslo in Norway, and also Ben Corden McKinley from BMT based in Melbourne. I would like to first begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet today and pay my respects to the elders past and present. I extend that respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people here today and uh, that continue to care for our island and our sea country. I appreciate everybody attending today. We have about 170 people that are attending this webinar, which is fantastic. And I'll be looking forward to seeing some interesting questions coming up in the Q&A. Just a couple of housekeeping matters, if I can, just before we get started, to ensure that attendees and presenters can see their slides, can you please make sure that your screen is on speaker view? And you can find that at the top in the middle of your Zoom function. Attendees are encouraged to use the Q&A function during the webinar, and the speakers will answer any questions you have at the end of each of their presentations. Um, attendees are able to upvote questions in the Q&A for the ones that are most popular to get up to the top and to make sure that those questions get answered. Please only use the chat if you're experiencing any technical issues or if you have a direct question to any of the panellists that you may not want uh, the Q&A discussion to see. I'm really excited about this presentation. Last week we had a great session about offshore wind um, that was presented about a project uh, in Gippsland, a two gigawatt offshore wind project called the Star of the South project in Victoria. Just to give a bit of a brief explanation about the Blue Economy CRC, we were established last year in 2019 with the support of the Australian Commonwealth Government and also 40 organisations from industry, research and the government sectors from across 10, 10 countries, including Australia. Um, our purpose is to perform world-class collaborative very industry focused research and training that will help underpin the growth of the blue economy. And that's through increased seafood, uh, offshore sustainable aquaculture um, production and also renewable energy production. Our two expert speakers today, Per Olan from DNB and Ben Corden McKinley from, uh, from sorry, Per Olan from DNBGL and Ben Corden McKinley from BMT you know, they're going to share with us their very valuable experience in offshore engineering and operations, which are really central to the mission that the CRC has. And that's to ensure that the platforms, the other infrastructure, the renewable energy systems that we're developing are robust enough to handle the high energy and exposed environments where our operations will occur. We have a dedicated research program around this in the CRC called Offshore Engineering and Technology. And I'd like to acknowledge Professor C.M. Wang from the University of Queensland and Dr. Najee Abdusami as well from the Australian Maritime College at the University of Tasmania who have come together to bring these two fantastic speakers with us. So I'm your facilitator for today. And so I would like to start by introducing our first speaker. So our first presentation is by Per Olan from DMVGL. DMV is going to, DMVGL is going to talk to us about an approach to de-risking offshore aquaculture units by applying tried and tested maritime classification concepts. So Pierre Lund has a master's from the University of Surrey in England, combined with some business and economic studies universities out of Norway. He's been working in advanced offshore service vessels and offshore installations, as well as the digitization sorry, for most of the 25 years in marine and offshore industry. You know, amongst the specialist areas throughout his career, um, Pear has been working at looking at the supply chain management, capability review of supplies and shipyards, uh, CE marking, risk assessments and system software integrity. And over the last few years, he's been involved in ensuring safety and operational experience in emerging segments of offshore renewables and exposed fish farming and aquaculture, which is central to what CRC is all about. He's also currently attending to offshore classification and business development at DMVGL's head office in Oslo. It's really a pleasure to introduce you, Pear, and I'm very happy for you if you would like to start sharing your slides and, and, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. 
thanks for the kind introduction, uh, Professor, and um, thanks for having me. Let me uh, just share my screen for you. So you can see um, some, of my, some of my slides. Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Presentation mode coming up, hopefully. Perfect. Thank you very much, Per. That's perfect. Right, right. Okay. Yes, my name is uh, Per Arild uh, Olam. Um, getting up early uh, this morning to, um, to, to have the pleasure of, uh, of interacting with you all. Um, I have been asked to talk about uh, offshore and exposed uh, fish farming and uh, how the Classification Society, uh, the NVGR, how they, we approach uh, this um, very um, emerging and exciting uh, segment uh, that we see are, are uh, really, really blooming uh, around the world uh, at the moment. Um, a few, a few, I'm going to start by doing a few words about the NVGL uh, for those that um, haven't had uh, the pleasure of interacting with us uh, previously. Uh, I will move on with uh, um, generally the big picture, offshore and exposed aquaculture. So what is the issue? Uh, what, why is that such a hot uh, topic uh, these days? Moving on to item number three, offshore fish farming installations. Um, spent some time sharing uh, with you uh, the perspective we have in northern part of Europe, um, what kind of um, challenges and opportunities we uh, see uh, when we uh, design, build, operate uh, uh, these uh, fairly new uh, novel installations. And the last but not least, of course, uh, number four, uh, uh, what is our main approach reducing uh, uh, risk? And uh, what are the main risk uh, factors that we take into uh, consideration when we uh, when we uh, do our assurance approach for these kinds of uh, projects. Right. Um, let me move on. Uh, DNVGL, Global Quality Assurance and Risk Management Company. A few numbers for you. Uh, approximately 12,000 uh, employees. Been around for a long time, 150 years. Apparently, we haven't been uh, that many. Uh, for so many uh, hundred years, but uh, that's how it is. Um, we have we have offices and, and stations around the world in more than hundred countries. Um, plenty of customers in many uh, industries. Um, more or less uh, happy customers. Uh, R and D five percent of R and D goes to R and D of our total uh, revenue. Main activities maritime, which I. Uh, work in. Uh, main bulk of activity is actually maritime classification, maritime assurance, um, oil and gas, uh, safety, energy, business assurance, dealing with ISO certification and uh, similar. Uh, and the last, uh, the last area, business area that we have is uh, digital solutions because uh, there are plenty of risks and uh, assurance cases uh, coming up due to the digitalization of the industry as we move along. Our main pur purpose in, uh, on this planet is to safeguard life, property and environment. We are striving for, uh, to be a trusted voice to tackle global transformation. Um, Global transformation these days are mainly uh, within sustainability and uh, digitization. Uh, most people would say. Um, last few numbers for you. Um, we have a, a global reach. We are present in more than 100 countries. We we have we are kind of proud of having 20% of the world fleet in operation both uh, offshore installations and the commercial ships are actually in our class meaning that we uh, that we regularly go on board every year and every five year to survey uh, and inspect um, uh, asset integrity regarding safety and safe operations uh, 
more than 11,000 of these we, we have on our list. Um, main, um, not main competitor, but main, uh, yes, uh, main competitor can be, uh, can be, um, can be uh, Lloyd's Register, Lloyd's Register in, the, in the England and ABS uh, in the US. So you know where, where you have us on the, on the industrial radar. So uh, that was, in short, a few words about my company, DMVGL. Um, let's move on to uh, uh, what's the issue with this offshore exposed uh, aquaculture. We, usually we use the term uh, offshore slash exposed uh, due to the fact that uh, there are a sliding scale of what is considered offshore um, areas. Uh, compared to near shore operations. Um, so we have also included this term exposed to better, to, to, to better uh, uh, emphasize uh, what kind of uh, areas we are talking about. Uh, then of, of course, in, in northern part of Europe, Nor uh, Europe Norway, we are, um, we are fortunate enough to have all these fjords. Uh, so we have a plenty of sheltered area where our aquaculture activity, and we can pet, put the net pens in, in, in the sea in, in fairly controlled, uh, nice uh, sea states. Um, typical um, graphics here of, uh, of the opportunities uh, that we have in the ocean space. Of course, what we are missing is um, uh, we see that we have uh, uh, bottom fixed um, offshore, uh, offshore um, turbine, wind turbine. We are getting more and more further out. We are getting more and more floating uh, offshore turbines. In addition to the, uh, to the traditional fish farms here, we are getting further offshore with more untraditional fish farming installations in between the uh, box uh, carriers and the drill ships and the cruise vessels and uh, subsea um, installations and so on. Um, yeah, w one of the things uh, that is, uh, of course, is really driving this initiative is the demand for seafood. Uh, we have new new and very mature generations coming up um, requiring uh, sustainable, healthy uh, food and are very focused on uh, what they eat. So this is uh, kind of a fairly old production, pro projection, but uh, still um, fairly valid, I would say, 2030. We are expecting more than uh, than 90 million tons, metric tons, that is, of uh, seafood uh, to be uh, supplied from uh, aquaculture. Fairly the same from uh, wild uh, catch. Uh, also, of course, very interesting to see that um, there is a balance between actually wild catch and, uh, and uh, aqua aquaculture um, uh, supply. Uh, and at the moment, uh, I, I think, or I think it was actually in 2003, uh, Norway actually exported more fish food from uh, fish farming than from wild catch. So uh, that gives us quite a quite a good picture of uh, of the scale of the market here. Uh, the other thing is uh, this prediction. Uh, most uh, most uh, statistical um, ana analytics are uh, they they agree that uh, we are expecting a growth of about uh, thirty three percent the next ten years. So the result in order to to provide all these healthy proteins on the on the plates of uh, people, uh, we we need to. Um, sluice in and put and face in uh, uh, hundreds of new um, high capacity uh, fish farms being offshore or on onshore or, or whatever, whatever solution it is. 
exponential growth, I think, is um, one of the main terms. Um, trouble is, at least in Norway, northern part of Europe, the fjords are packed with net pens. Um, we are approaching the, the sustainability threshold for what the environment can take. Well, at least this photo doesn't um, it doesn't seem that packed this uh, fjord, but uh, but uh, some of the waters are really shallow and uh, it can't have, take uh, that much uh, uh, the environment before it's being stressed. Uh, so then the question is um, uh, what to do when well, the challenge is that uh, we have uh, are reaching the saturation point of the environment. Typically, two new ways to go. You could go on land, these re recirculation um, plants. We see and we hear uh, a lot about this being planned around the world. Uh, uh, I think the one that is... is um, is talked about a lot is this Atlantic Sapphire uh, plant in uh, Miami that has been fairly successful so far, but it's definitely uh, a very promising uh, segment. Uh, and of course, you could go offshore. And going offshore is, uh, the sea is already there. So uh, that is, uh, of course, for, for, uh, for a coastal nations such as uh, Australia, New Zealand, Norway, and uh, many of these countries, it's a natural choice. Right, offshore fish farming installations, number three. So I guess uh, that was setting the scene. So this is what we're talking about. <laughs> I brought up these two graphics for you because um, we don't have many of these installations in operation as yet. Um, in Norway, we have uh, the number is six. Uh, the two you can see here are, um, uh, are, the, are the two biggest with, a, with the largest uh, volume of uh, biomass. Uh, the latest one that was phased into production this summer, July, is, is actually this G, uh, green giant called Half Farm One. Um, for those of you that uh, are um, fascinated by steel, steel structures, uh, this is um, really um, a nice story for you. 33,000 tons of uh, steel to enjoy. Um, I, I will get back to the, uh, this with uh, some more details uh, just to illustrate uh, what we're talking about uh, later on. First of all, I, I, I'd like to share with you some opportunities and uh, challenges that we have uh, experienced um, dealing with this uh, new solution. So I've, I split it into uh, three headings, business, technology and operations. Um, uh, first of all, they claim, um, they claim that um, the, the, the few the few fish for offshore fish farms that has been in operation so far, uh, we see that uh, there, there are more or less um, a, a premium uh, product uh, coming out uh, of uh, of these uh, fish farms. The fish is uh, and this is Atlantic salmon. I have to add, uh, of course, uh, you could put other species in the sea in other waters, but uh, in in Norway it's uh, of course Atlantic salmon that is. Uh, that is uh, uh, in the pens. Uh, we, we see we see the the, the a new uh, premium um, range, very close to wild catch, uh, healthy fish, fairly happy, healthy, uh, fit uh, fish uh, with uh, good quality, which is uh, which is good uh, for um, for uh, for the market. Uh, this is, of course, a total game changer, and a lot of uh, of um, uh, fish farmers in northern Europe uh, are uh, a little bit concerned about this because you don't need a nice uh, sheltered fjord anymore to 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 do your fish farming. Uh, you know, you could uh, build a, a rud uh, fairly rugged, efficient uh, offshore installation. Um, make sure that uh, salinity, uh, temperature, water temperature, uh, oxygen level, uh, and all, 
all these uh, environmental parameters are in place, and then you can just uh, get to uh, get into business. Uh, I can see I spent 14 minutes already, so I'll speed up a little bit, uh, Irene. Actually, no worries. Um, but the game changer is, uh, I think, uh, it's worth mentioning. Um, uh, uh, another another issue here is to see that um, the the normal designers uh, that has been supplying designers, yards, uh, vendors that has been uh, supplying for traditional maritime offshore uh, segment, uh, they have gone fishing, they have changed, and they apply their, uh, their knowledge into uh, this segment. Of course, capex uh, intensive, very high uh, initial costs, uh, uh, the uh, traditionally the net uh, the fish in the net pen is much more valuable than the net pen the asset itself currently but uh, now it's the other way around we have what have driven the, the this in, uh, incentive uh, is incentive schemes from Norwegian government so that is actually what has driven the the, the development I put that in brackets but because I know there are uh, incentive schemes in all other countries technology um, of course, in all segments where, where technology is running far ahead of uh, statutory requirements or, or governmental requirements, th there are some statutory confusion um, requirements for safe operation. It doesn't fit this mode of, uh, this mode of uh, offshore fish farming. Uh, often there is a regulatory void that, of course, uh, the new GL is, is able to fill and with reasonable requirements. Digitization, uh, very, very much um, um, in the need here, both to uh, monitor the health of uh, and growth of uh, the fish in the pen, as well as uh, asset uh, management. Fish escape, uh, of course, uh, now we are talking, we are not talking 100,000 salmons in the pen, we are talking millions, more, maybe more than a million uh, fish in the pen. If they escape, it's bad news. Mass escape is, uh, is a disaster. Uh, mainly in Northern Europe, uh, we are concerned about uh, environmental uh, contamination um, mix with, uh, with the wild uh, river salmons. Uh, other parts of the world are more concerned about the bottom line because escaped fish is a loss of um, cash flow. Um, but still, fish escape um, technology-wise, uh, something that needs to be uh, addressed by uh, monitoring these uh, net pens and uh, new materials in the net pen technology. Last but not least, uh, operations. Uh, we get uh, rougher sea states. Um, uh, demanding marine operations uh, will have to be expected. Um, and then, of course, you have the competence gap. Or, or competence challenge because you have to two totally different industries uh, combining. Uh, and usually we see that uh, when we put these uh, fish farms into operation, uh, there are uh, offshore maritime staff. They don't know anything about uh, fish farming. And there are the fish farming team uh, which uh, do not know too many things about uh, the marine operations. So there is um, it's a new combination of uh, competence uh, when it comes to uh, personnel and money that we need to address. Uh, I don't know how, uh, how much lies you have um, in, in your part of the world. Northern Europe is uh, it's, uh, really, really um, um, a, a challenge. But uh, operation-wise, uh, we see less lies. We, we do not need to um, bother the fish with all these delicing processes that really wears it uh, down, uh, less diseases. And of course, last but not least, you have the uh, operational logis logistics because uh, you have a massive fleet of service vessels 
uh, serving this uh, fish farm, bringing out supplies, uh, fish feed, uh, live fish carriers, uh, stun and bleed vessels, um, cleaning, survey of the net pen, and so on. Um, um, yeah, this is one of the most important slides, uh, I would guess. Just to illustrate, I dumped some, uh, illustrate, I dumped some um, graphics uh, for you. Um, illustrating uh, all uh, the different uh, uh, installations and vessels that need to be uh, put into operation to, 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 to ensure uh, a smooth, uh, a smooth um, processing of these uh, offshore fish farms. Uh, yeah. Feed barges, as I'm pointing out here now, are getting very, very advanced. It used to be a, a, a concrete, um, uh, a concrete uh, floater with a, with a tree house on top of it, and, and now you are talking something totally different. Um, mainly, the fleet, this this fleet that is being put into operation now, are are very green uh, in a way. Uh, it's hybrid operate, hybrid powered, a combination of uh, diesel uh, and uh, battery or LNG and battery, and, uh, and now very soon we have the first uh, hydrogen powered uh, vessel being planned. Right, um, one of the first, very first uh, fish farming um, installation that was put into water is uh, this one, Ocean Farm uh, 1, it is called. Uh, I can see I spent about 20 minutes now. Uh, can, I, can I do four more? Yeah. Three nodes, three nodes, good. Yeah, the time is running very quickly when, you, when you're having fun. Uh, so I apologize for that. Um, but uh, this is what, uh, this installation is uh, yeah, fairly big scale, 110 meters in diameter, one and a half million, max capacity is one and a half million salmon. I don't think it has been running up until this capacity yet. It has been uh, through two cycles. They were taking out everything, and um, uh, uh, this October, September. Um, so this one was the very first one put uh, in the water, uh, built in China, in uh, Qingdao, uh, China. Uh, what you see on top of here is actually something that I put there just to uh, tickle your. Uh, uh, to, to, to tickle your uh, curiosity, because uh, that is the, the approach we use when we class things. It's called a class classification string. It tells you what kind of uh, uh, verification uh, it has been uh, uh, put through. Um, this one here, the gene, uh, green uh, giant, um, put into production July this uh, summer. I think it's only two third uh, full into production. Um, yes, designed by NSK, which is traditionally a fish uh, fishing a trawler uh, designer, but uh, they have decided to to change uh, trade. Uh, the length, have a look on the length, three hundred and eighty five meters. Um, one of the large, largest largest. Um, uh, aircraft carriers uh, is in the range of 330 meters, so it's um, a huge uh, giant, and they are planning number two. And I can tell you that this one here, they are now planning another 10 of these to be built and put into water in the next 10 years. So, uh, so uh, it's, it's very aggressive. Um, uh, uh, on this uh, end. Um, uh, two projects, of course, there are, there, are, there are several projects that are being planned in the in the feed uh, phase. The, this too has come a uh, fairly uh, long way down the road, uh, front end uh, engineering and design. This one is uh, called um, Fjord Mox, uh, delta shaped with uh, three uh, 60 meter uh, net pens. Uh, remotely operated from land, only manned uh, during regular working hours, uh, operating exposed but closer to shore, 
Uh, and then, of course, you have this giant, uh, 160 meters in diameter, 3 million salmon uh, with a, hel a helideck and uh, will be operated more or less um, as a regular oil and gas offshore installation. Um, just uh, with all the salmon in the pen, uh, will be very, very exposed, uh, yeah, installed in exposed areas, around 10 to 12 meters uh, significant uh, wave height, um, massive, very rig uh, rugged um, center column here with the processing plant. Just to bring up a few of the examples, maybe uh, I guess you, you maybe heard about this already. Uh, both of these looking for uh, yards at the moment. I think yards will be concluded around Easter time next year. So um, very concrete. Make the leap with the NVGL. Um, last item, how do we reduce risk? Um, we have about a minute to go. Thanks. I will, uh, yeah, that, that fits really well. Thank you. Uh, because um, uh, we have two, two kind of um, vessel types um, that we define. Uh, you, if you have propulsion, we call it a fish farming unit. If you are uh, moved permanently to one location, we call it uh, offshore fish farming installation. Um, most class societies, uh, when they want to save the world and make a significant contribute to the industry, they issue uh, rules for classification. This is how you should do it. So we did the same thing, of course. Um, if it's one thing you should keep in mind when you when you leave this uh, webinar, you know, uh, I want you to uh, Google this. You could just um, download it uh, free from from our web uh, page. Uh, and in addition to this, we have a so-called class notation, meaning that you prove for the rest of the industry that um, that fish escape prevention uh, is uh, focused uh, on. So a typical class notation will be, look something like this. Postmore is a position mooring to make sure that it stays in position. Uh, mainly when when we consider the risk, this is fairly known to most of you. Uh, when we consider the risk, uh, we split it into two, into three, asset integrity, stability, structural integrity, and so on. HSC, when it comes to fire safety, life saving. And then last but not least, prevent fish escape. Um, and then we built uh, the concept on pr prescriptive uh, rules uh, for HSE, we very much apply regular, well-known uh, maritime codes, uh, SOLAS, MARPOL, so on. Uh, and then we have a separate uh, guidance, OTG, offshore technical guidance for fish escape, can also be downloaded for free, of course. So this is pulled together in one sort of, you can call it a one uh, assurance bundle dealing with uh, the classification rules, the maritime codes and the offshore, offshore technical guidance. And then, uh, you know, in the class world, you flag uh, these capability, safety capability, you always flag that with a, with a class string um, uh, illustrating uh, your potential. Last 10 seconds. When you do class, what is actually happening? Um, first, you do design approval, check out the design, make sure the arrangement and the design is within rules and requirements. Then we go to the yard, this time in China with a green giant, make sure that they actually built what is on the drawings, welding uh, quality and so on. And then you certify all the crucial equipment going on board all safety crucial equipment, um, mooring line here, and then you follow up in operation, yearly and five yearly on board uh, service. And then there's an experience uh, loop uh, at the end. Um, slightly over time, sorry about that, but uh, that's it for me.
Thank you very much, Pear. We really appreciate a very insightful presentation and the Blue Economy CRC and its aquaculture partners have been looking at some of these large sort of mega structures for offshore aquaculture in the CRC. There's some really good questions that are coming up at the moment and I'd like to throw a few questions to you. Um, one of them actually you've already answered. One was specifically about some of DMVGL's rules and guidelines specifically for these offshore aquaculture infrastructure that came from one of the deputy program leaders. So thank you, Najee. I think that question has been answered. Um, there's another question here that says that they can imagine that it makes economical sense to build these gigantic structures in concrete rather than steel. Are the class societies looking to support customers to use alternative materials to steel? Uh, we do, we do. Uh, we, we are involved in, I can think of at least uh, uh, two projects uh, applying uh, concrete. Um, two in Norway, one in China. Uh, so a concrete material uh, is uh, definitely a um, uh, possibility for um, efficient uh, material utilization. Also these uh, more exotic materials uh, such as uh, you know, plastic, uh, Kevlar uh, uh, combinations are, are, are being looked into. So uh, also, we see, uh, yes, and the rules and requirements actually embrace uh, concrete uh, as well. That's excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I'll run through a couple more questions as well. So thank you very much, Sebastian, for that question. Um, there was a question here um, about um, the powering, so the, the energy requirements for these structures. And currently earlier, you spoke to the fact that most of these at the moment are currently being powered through diesel and battery. Have you seen an integration now where you're moving to offshore renewables to utilise the, you know, the sources that are predominantly in that environment, whether it be wave or wind, for example? We, we, see, we see that uh, some of the concepts that are in the early feed phase are um, uh, actually um, uh, installing um, smaller wind turbines uh, on the structure. Uh, th th there are some challenges there regarding uh, noise, uh, vibration. Uh, we, we have some initiatives in the Far East where you actually have um, um, uh, offshore wind turbines uh, uh, with a, a tripod uh, fundaments, uh, bottom fixed, and you you install a net pen pen between in the tripod, and you uh, breed fish. Uh, so uh, a few combinations of this we have seen. Um, we haven't seen many of these materializing, but uh, so far. Um, uh, many of these uh, will be powered by, by land, uh, land power, uh, actually green land power, because uh, in Northern Europe, we are, we are fortunate enough to have a lot of uh, water, hydro water uh, power from, from uh, waterfalls. So you're um, suggesting and... that potentially the Hub Farm 1, for example, that was designed and built, which, which is predominantly for offshore, such as the Rolls-Royce one as well, um, that's been built um, is predominantly going to be powered through shore, from a shore connection. Correct. Correct. And how, what Correct. kind of distance are you talking? Uh, we, are to we, are talking um, we are talking kilometres, uh, yes. not several nautical miles, but uh, uh, the, these, the, the, uh, these installations that, that we've seen today are more exposed. Uh, many people would say that uh, you couldn't categorize it as an offshore location, uh, but still uh, they are exposed uh, with, um, they are not sheltered uh, and uh, are subject to some uh, rough uh, sea states uh, and uh, weather. Thank you. I'm only going to take one more question and there's quite a few in the, the um, Q&A that you might have a chance to answer as well. Um, what are the statutory requirements applicable to aquaculture structures in Norway? Uh, DMV GL, for example, looking at the Norwegian statutory regulations as part of this? 
Yes, yes. We we are uh, for 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 fish farms uh, offshore fish farms in uh, in Norwegian waters. We are combining the statutory regulations and uh, integrating them into the regular class assurance uh, package. Um, and having said that, uh, the the statutory regulations for fish farming in Norway doesn't fit uh, offshore fish farming operation that well. Uh, it is more. It is more. Um, um, it is more tuned to near shore operation, uh, uh, and doesn't embrace the challenges uh, you will get with uh, uh, rough sea and um, mm. and uh, uh, people being permanently uh, located on site. Thank you. I think. Look, given the time, it's a really interesting presentation, and there's been. Plenty of questions in the q and A. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you very much, Per Olan, for your presentation today. And um, I'm happy for you to answer any questions that are in the Q&A as well. But I might now move over to Ben Corden McKinley. And Ben Corden McKinley is gonna give us the next presentation. And I'm conscious of the time, Ben, and I'll, and I'll try and give you adequate time to present and to answer a few questions. Ben's topic is around BMT's design for safe transfer of crew to offshore wind farms through vessel design requirements and what crew transfer requirements are expected for offshore aquaculture operations. So Ben Corden McKinley is a naval architect with six years experience in the marine industry. He's had a number of different roles. He's worked in a range of environments from shipyards to small consulting firms and a very diverse projects. Ben's most recent position was managing a small boat workshop putting him in contact with some unique maintenance issues for smaller craft. But pr prior to this, he worked for BAE Systems on a range of different projects, defence-related projects, obviously, as well, and as a naval architect and project engineer um, across the LHD and ANZAC platforms, uh, predominantly some of the projects he's worked on. He's been a designer for BAE Systems um, during the bid for the patrol class boats. Um, um, replacement that was happening in Australia and, and he's joined BMT Defence and Security in August 2018 and that's where he's currently at as a naval architect and part of the Royal Institution of Naval Architects as well. I'm very fortunate that Ben is presenting today. Ben was one of my graduates from the Australian Maritime College back in 2012. So Ben, it is really a pleasure to have you here and to present with all this experience that you've, you've got in this area and really looking forward to your presentation. Please take, take it away and I'll let you know if um, we can see your slides fine. Perfect. Well, that's, that's not too bad for an introduction. So I hope that I can do justice to that. So I'll just share my screen. Share and that should do the trick. Everyone see that all right? We can. Thank you, Ben. That's Good. perfect. Excellent. Well, as Irene very capably introduced, I'm a naval architect with BMT. Um, I work with both naval and commercial vessels, um, big and small, grey and coloured. Um, most of it comes across my desk. Um, so today I'm speaking about the, um, the crew transfer aspects and the design aspects of BMT's wind farm support vessels and how they might cross over to um, offshore aquaculture. Um, BMT, BMT is uniquely experienced in these boats. Um, quite a lot of the um, vessels operating around the world um, doing crew transfer for wind uh, turbines have been designed by BMT. Um, I'm also going to touch on some of the regulatory aspects that might surround the use of these type of vessels in Australia. So let's see if I can make this work. There we go. So briefly what I'm going to go, um, go through today, I'm going to, I'll um, discuss our experience, BMT's experience, um, what these boats are and where they came from, how they got to the way they are, the transfer systems that are in use, some of the propulsion hull form aspects, um, comfort, which is a big deal on these, um, limiting factors in the design, differences and tweaks that might be need to be made for aquaculture and identifying some of the legislative hurdles and things that we might need to get ahead of before we start using these boats in Australia. Uh, and then I'll sort of wrap up at the end with my thoughts and BMT's thoughts on what we could do in Australia. So just to introduce BMT, um, we're the biggest little company no one's ever heard of. We, um, we're a global company. So we've got about 1,500 people globally with the BMTs and amalgamation of amalgamation. So we work in many different fields. 
Um, in Australia, the sector I work for, we have about 50 people, but then in Australia more broadly is about 200 um, with other sites all over the world. Um, we're a unique company in that we're owned by our employees, so we don't answer the shareholders, um, which puts us in a unique position to offer advice to many of our customers. So as I said, we're, we're all over the place, coming to an office near you. Um, we work in offshore wind sectors, offshore oil and gas, um, defence, um, civil vessels, ferries, um, environmental consulting, you name it, there's probably a BMT uh, branch in there. So what are these boats and where do they come from? So what happened is they started, as the wind farms started to get bigger, uh, well, as they started, they were relatively near shore, it was small fishing work boats that were chartered out to run to and from the, um, the turbines. As the, as the farms got bigger, more complicated and further offshore, they turned into dedicated vessels that were designed for moving crew and equipment to and from um, the turbines. And then the next step they had was to try and optimise the transfer system and try and do some more design around that, which was seen as a, seen as a critical um, aspect of them. They're a very interesting boat because they carry both cargo and passengers. That they're, they're kind of a ferry. You'd almost think of it as a twin cab view. You've got to carry people and equipment. So the transfer technique, this is the crux of the vessel. So it's referred to as the stick or slip method. Um, it appears relatively straightforward. You nose into the, the turbine and the people hop off. However, on a bad day, it gets a little more complicated than that. Um, so the reason that the, the turbine industry has got to this is rather than having to use, say, something like a pilot ladder where the, the operator has to time their jump so that you jump off the vessel as a, on the crest of a wave so that the boat falls away from underneath you and doesn't come up and collect you on the way up. Here you're trying to keep everything stationary for the operator to walk across. Um, there's been a range of different um, fendering systems trial, which is kind of key to this, but oddly enough, rubber has come out to just be the, the best all round um, material for it. The other um, aspect of this is that the vessels can't approach too quickly. So the turbine manufacturers state about 300 kilonewtons of force to go into the turbine before they can cause damage. Um, that equates to roughly one knot of boat speed, which puts high demands on the maneuverability of the vessel coming alongside. Um, the design of this transfer system, we believe, is where um, offshore aquaculture in Australia and um, offshore wind in Australia can really get ahead because this, we think this, this system is where the real key is. So I've got a short video here. So this is BMT's active fender system, which is a um, patent for, for BMT. And that's this system here. So what I'm about to show you is a video looking down from the turbine of a vessel approaching. And this is what BMT really feel can be brought to the Australian industry. So I'll just start the video here. So you'll notice these two little gaps here. These engage with a standardised um, system on the, um, on the turbine. And you'll see that this is sprung, which reduces the loads into the vessel. And this is also level. So what this does is make sure that you don't have to step up onto a platform you're not exposed. Um, these two big pillars in front of the ladder also mean that you're not going to get um, crushed as the person being transferred on and off. Um, this is the active fendering system one. There's a two and a three. This is quite a narrow system. You'll see the, the two is wider. So you, you get a larger area that you can impact the um, platform. And then the, the revision three is larger again um, for, uh, and is designed for bigger bigger boats with more energy when they come into come into impact. And I must apologise. I'm presently in a thunderstorm, so if you hear some loud bumps, that's uh, what we've got. So propulsion. This is there's you know there's actually five options, and I'll briefly touch on the fifth one, but it's not very popular. So key to the um, operation of the vessel is the choice of propulsion system. So the simplest one you have is your fixed pitch propeller. This is bread and butter prop and shaft. Um, it's the cheapest system. It's quite fuel efficient. However, it's hard to get its efficiency 
therefore both bolide pull or bolide push pushing up against the platform and for top speed when you're transiting to and from. Um, they're very low maintenance uh, and they provide a reasonable speed and bolide pull even when optimized for top speed. However, they are limited in maneuverability and as vessels get bigger, they start to rely on things like bow thrusters in order to give you that fine control coming up to the platform. Um, and as I said, they're difficult to optimize for both speed and bolide pull. And by difficult, I mean almost impossible. Your next option is a controllable pitch propeller. So a brief explanation, my apologies to anyone who's um, familiar with this. It looks very similar to a fixed pitch propeller, but these blades rotate relative to the hub. So you imagine they change direction. This means that the propeller shaft moves at a constant speed, but the blades change to adjust um, speed. And they can also be adjusted to, um, to let the vessel go in reverse, which that opti uh, gives you high maneuverability. So you're not waiting for a shaft to slow down and then spin in reverse. You can give it full power in reverse very quickly. Um, they provide a, sh a shallow draft in combination with a um, propeller tunnel. It's still a relatively simple operation. It's on at an enormous added level of complexity. Um, they're often used in a quad installation, giving you some more redundancy. However, they are, what they provide is greater efficiency in more places, but overall they are less efficient than a fixed pitch propeller. They offer lower bollard pull, um, and you do need to, you need to know what you're doing so that you don't stall the blade out when you're pushing up on the um, platform. Which leads me into water jets. So water jets are certainly one of the more popular options at the moment, um, typically in quad installations to give um, higher redundancy. They provide a good top speed. Um, again, they can be very quick forward reverse because you drop uh, this propeller bucket in front of the jet nozzle to permit going backwards. They can provide good bollard pull. However, to do this, you've got to oversize the jet. Um, my apologies for the heavy rain that's just started. Um, if you specify the correct jet for that size of boat for say a fast ferry, it will perform badly in bowline pull. Um, one of their weaknesses as well is in doing that, you've, you've also got to be quite skilled when you push up against the platform not to ventilate the jet by pushing too hard, because you can do that, ventilate the jet, and then you'll get pushed back off the platform, um, breaking free. They are a higher cost and they're more complex and they, they have higher demand for maintenance. The next option is um, IPS. So this is a Volvo Penta product. So these <clears throat> uh, look a bit like an azimuth thruster on a tug. So these rotate. Um, they're typically installed in quad installations. These provide the sort of best of both worlds between the water jet and the fixed pitch propeller. They're quite efficient. They provide excellent maneuverability because they're joystick controlled. Um, these um, Propellers can, uh, propeller pods can rotate independently of each other and be engaged forward and reverse independently. Um, they also provide a position keeping function. So you can, it's akin to dynamic positioning, but not dynamic positioning as by, per class. Um, however, they do provide, that they do require more maintenance. Coming out of the recreational market, they, they're more reliant on maintenance and they have a lower duty cycle. However, at the moment, that's proving to be sort of the real, this is what everyone's going for. Um, the fifth option is what's referred to as a linear jet, which is a cross between a fixed pitch propeller and a water jet. It's, it's a ducted propeller. Um, BMT today, the only designed and built one of these vessels, they provide excellent bollard pull. Um, however, they're very expensive to make and they're not as maneuverable as a water jet. They're more akin to a fixed pitch propeller. So the way to visualize one of those is, is a semi built in court nozzle like on a tug underneath the, the vessel. And um, they're also prohibitively expensive, but not much gain. So they're not seeing wide use. So next is a hull form development. So the there's a few options here. The first you find is a full formed catamaran. So a catamaran provides an excellent deck space. It's just a big square um, area with which to fill with people or equipment. However, there's a bit to it. Um, a full form catamaran such as this, so you see that's quite quite beamy here, um, quite bluff. What happens is they have a lot of trouble engaging with the turbines as in, in wave, it, they're both driven up in pitch from the wave, but they're also driven backwards off the, um, off the, uh, the turbine um, by the added resistance from waves. That they're, they're quite sensitive to that. So even with proper power application, you could find yourself getting pushed off the 
um, the plant. BMT solution was a much finer uh, forward body in the catamaran. So what this is less sensitive, it's got a lower water plane area. So it's less sensitive to pitch and less sensitive to waves coming in. Think of it as cutting the water better. It's a, it's a finer shape. So they tend to engage with the platform very well. They're not, it's not an, an enormous level of complexity. They're not necessarily any more expensive than a full form catamaran and they provide a really good platform. Another option that's seen as a swath, which is a small water plane area twin hull. Um, swaths are excellent in providing a stable platform uh, in a seaway. However, the problem with them is they're, they're not particularly fast. Um, they're quite expensive for what they are. They're very complex. Um, maintaining the underwater equipment is very difficult because getting access to it is quite hard because this is so narrow. They're also um, very, very sensitive to changes in weight. So because you have such a small water plane area, you need a very complex ballasting system in order to counteract any loads on the deck. So they don't lend themselves well to loading and unloading fuel and equipment um, quickly. The last is basically a foot in each cam camp of a catamaran and a swath. And this is a BMT um, patent develop development is the extreme semi swath. So it's taking, it's, it's making a, a finer water plane area than even a fine form catamaran and combining that with um, the abilities of a swath to um, resist motion from waves. So they provide a, a more stable platform, but still with some load carrying capability and still with efficiency and speed, less than a catamaran, but much more than a swath. So that's kind of the, the optimized solution for a distant wind farm. This leads me on to length and comfort. So it's no good being able to get out to your turbine or fish farm and having everyone on board violently ill, not only from a cleaning perspective, but also from guys actually being able to do work. So what we've found is as a broad rule, now this graph shows you at 24 knots, um, the motion sickness incidence, uh, a 10% MSI motion sickness incidence. So that's this is the, the line at which you expect that these lines here represent when 10% of the people on board are going to be sick after a certain time. And we find, so for a given wave height, you can see here that the occupants of a 16 metre vessel, 10% well, of them will, will start being crook after half an hour. Whereas for a 30 metre vessel, you can be out there for an hour and three quarters almost. So as a general rule, the bigger you are, the, um, the less you're going to move around and the longer your exposure time is and the longer your transit can be. The upshot as well is you're also carrying more equipment, so you may have to make fewer trips. Um, this idea of having people ready to work is really important and that's one of the main drivers in the wind turbine transfer industry. So some of the limiting factors we find, um, transit time is key, that drives vessel size. If you've got to go for a long time, you've got to have a bigger boat. And if you're going further, you want to take more people with you so you're not running backwards and forwards. Um, personal comfort comes out of that because the longer you're out there, the more comfortable that vessel has to be. And then personal safety transferring, as, as I demonstrated earlier. And that's where a bigger vessel starts to become an issue because you've got to be really careful with that transfer because a bigger boat is at one knot is going to have more inertia than a smaller one. And you're more likely to damage the turbine and exceed that. 300 newton uh, kilonewton meter, 300 kilonewton limit. Ben, just to let you know, we, we're at five o'clock. If we've got a few more minutes and then maybe we get a chance to take a few questions. Perfect, I'll, I'll wrap it up. And then based on vessel size, you get pushed through different ways through class and flag. 35 meters is a bit of a demarcation line for when you've got to start involving class. So what are the differences for aquaculture from these boats? We think they're pretty good, but in Australia, at least we're talking single or tens of miles, like 10, maybe 20, not 50, 60, 70, 100 miles like um, some of the wind farm installations are. So it's a shorter distance and a higher duty cycle. You're probably gonna make multiple trips. The other thing is, and the wind farm boats are used like this, is they're gonna be a jack of all trades. They're gonna be taking people one minute and then fish food the next, and then maybe spare parts one day, diesel the next, 
they need to be a real multi-purpose boat and we think the the wind farm support vessel is going to be really good for that legislation i think this is where this is where we think the game is going to be won or lost in uh, the UK, they, they were very much on the back foot with trying to regulate this industry. They got to a really good place. I think in Australia, what we're going to have to do is put some really good effort into defining special personnel because we don't want to be a passenger ship. If you think passengers, think of your granny. These are going to be prof people going to work on aquaculture installations. They're going to be introduced to the vessels. Um, they're going to be part of the safety management system. You're going to expect a certain level of knowledge of transfer operations, of being on a boat. So I think this is a really good area to get out ahead and call these people special personnel and put some really clear guidance in place for what training they need to have to be called this. So we can, we can confidently say they are not passengers, they are not crew, they're special personnel, which means that we're not gonna get pushed into passenger vessel regulations, which I think will be the, will really hamper these vessels. Um, also trying to avoid the high speed craft code because I don't think these things need to go, we don't think these things need to go particularly fast and that's going to drive a lot of weight and additional cost into these boats. Um, and as such, I think they're really well catered for under the um, Australian Mar um, Maritime Safety Authority's NSCV code in the beginning. I think these are, these are going to start as smaller boats and I think that code with some clear definition around special, special personnel and some of the more technical aspects is going to be really good. So to conclude, I think what we need is the Gen 1 wind transfer vessel with the latest generation transfer system. Um, we don't need the extreme semi-swath and the expense. I think what we need is a fine form catamaran um, of which Australia, the Australian industry and BMT globally are very well placed to design. I think the transfer system, that's where, it, where, we, where we can really learn some lessons from the wind farm boats and incorporate that standardized unit into the offshore aquaculture industry and offshore um, wind farm industry. It would also permit us to buy secondhand boats from overseas and use them here because they've got to plug into the same hole, that it's, it's the same engagement. So overall, I think Australia is in a really good position to get out ahead of regulation at a, at a statutory level and, and really make us a market for these boats and get the most out of them and, and be have the best regulations before, so we can save a lot of money. So, um, on bike, any questions? Thank you all very much for your um, kind attention. Thank you very much, Ben. Really interesting as well. And I know that we've got a few questions in the Q and A. And I think we have. We're going to take five minutes extra and take on some questions. There's a question here. Um, that says that the offshore industry has some really good experience with using motion compensated systems like gangways as well for personnel transfer. Are these being used for offshore wind farms and or does design as has BMT been looking at these type of design vessels? I might extend that a little bit to say that although today we spoke very much about fixed bottom wind and support vessels for fixed bottom wind there's a potential market for floating offshore wind. And so I think it could be very much related to that type of question as well. Yeah, so Thanks. they are out there. Um, BMT is very much going down the stick or the slip method. The, those systems are excellent. They're used quite rightly in the offshore industry. These boats are, are lighter and smaller and they don't lend themselves to the weight and complexity of them. Um, and that's done correctly. The stick or slip method gives you the most bang for your buck. Um, that they are a good option. And I think once we get really big and a long way offshore, that's the way it's going to go. Once your boat gets to a certain size and we start talking big steel monohulls, that's probably where, where we would end up going. I mean, there's nothing to say that these have to be catamarans, but I think cats lend themselves at the moment. And a, a light aluminium cat doesn't lend itself well to those mo motion comp compensated systems. But they are out there. They're just not very common at all. About 90 odd percent are this this method. Thanks, Ben. There's another question here that said that, you know, as seen in um, the presentation by Pear, um, that the structures used in fish farms are, are pretty huge and have a much bigger water line than wind turbines. So the dimensions should provide much more sheltering than what wind turbines can offer. Do you think that using this wave sheltering could solve most of the transfer issue? 
think, yeah, you definitely use the lee of the, the larger vessel, so yeah, your hay farms or something like that, much like a pilot um, boat does. I think, though, you're still going to have that ocean swell. Um, I think what it does is really make that stick or slip method even better because you can you can operate in a in a much higher sea state because where you're doing the transfer is actually much lower. So I think it makes it a lot safer with with the current technology, if that, that makes sense. It, it certainly helps. Um, I wouldn't say totally alleviate that. Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you so much. They're the questions that we have for today. And I really think that they've been excellent presentations to help people really get a feel for the type of infrastructure that's going to be required for moving aquaculture and renewables offshore. And, and it's, it's not just the platforms, but it's also all of the support vessels that are going to be required to ensure that that becomes a cost effective and economic solution uh, in terms of the type of production, volume of production people would like to see happen offshore. And I think that your expertise has been fantastic. So I really appreciate uh, Ben and Pear for your time today. Um, and your participation, of course, in the Blue Economy CRC. And I appreciate all the people today for their questions that have been put forward. I can see that a few have been answered in the chat as well. I look forward to being able to highlight another webinar that will be coming up in December. Please keep an eye on the Blue Economy CRC website for further information. And I wish you a nice evening and a good day.